60 Minutes, Rewind. In April of this year, America, the world, was stunned by the killing of Dr. Martin Luther King. In December, at Christmas time, 60 Minutes went to the King home in Atlanta, Georgia, to see how his family was faring. We visited last Saturday with Coretta King and her four children. Mrs. King, I wonder if you'd introduce your family to us. This is Dexter Scott. And how old are you, Dexter? Seven. Now, uh, this fellow over here. This is Martin Luther III. We call him Marty. And how old are you, Marty? I'm 11 years old. I imagine, of course, that you bear your name with great pride, your father's name, but uh, are there any, uh, ever any difficulties because you are Martin Luther King? Well, sometimes I, there are difficulties, but most of the times they aren't because, well, I guess they, well, most of the times there aren't any difficulties, but sometimes they are. What, what kind of thing? Well, like sometimes people tell me, ask me my father's name, and sometimes they tease me about my name and things like that. Mm hmm But mostly? Mostly they, most, most of the time nobody teases me mm -hmm. anything. Have you decided what you're going to do when you grow up? I want to be a preacher like my father. You do? Yeah. And this is Bunny. Yes. And what are you expecting for Christmas, Bunny? A bicycle, mm -hmm. a horn, mm -hmm. a doll. To your left is Yolanda, Yolanda Denise. We call her Yoki. How old are you, Yoki? I'm 13. And where do you go to school and what grade are you in? I go to Grady High School and I'm in the ninth grade. In as much as you're 13, you're the oldest one in the family, do you have uh, special responsibilities? Well, uh, since I'm the oldest and all, I have to watch after Marty and Dexter and Bunny, and they aren't really that much trouble. And when Mother goes out of town, we have to, I have to look after them. And it's, it's not really that much to do. They're kind of independent. I must say they are a handsome and healthy and pretty happy-looking bunch of children, and Yogi especially. I imagine that she must have been a real consolation at the, at the time of the tragedy. Yes, she was, uh, Mike. Um, she was really so much of a consolation to me because of the way she accepted this uh, with so much understanding and so much courage and, and it was so reassuring to me and she said to me, Mommy, I'm not going to cry because my dad is not dead. He may be dead physically. And one day, I'm going to see him again. And she said, Mommy, you are such a brave and strong lady. I don't know what I'd do if I were in your shoes. Mommy, should I hate the man who killed my dad in? And I said, no, darling, Daddy wouldn't want you to do that. And of course, I also said to her, you are so brave, and I'm so proud of you. And I put my arms around her. And of course, she didn't cry very much. I didn't see her crying anymore, really. Mm -hmm. And, and, and she's been very happy uh, and very well adjusted since because she, she too feels that there was meaning in this death. You know, what my husband said so often that unearned suffering is redemptive. And I think uh, somehow all of us have felt that, that uh, he gave his life in such a meaningful way uh, that what he lived for and what he gave his life for will bring about some of the changes that are necessary. But let me ask you, Mrs. King, I think that some of us sit around sometimes and wonder if the death of Martin Luther King didn't leave the civil rights movement for a lot of people leaderless, rudderless. 
I don't think that this is so. I, I think that if we are looking for another Martin Luther King, we won't find him because uh, he comes once in a century, uh, maybe once in a thousand years. Um, but there are many other persons now who will come forth, I believe, and assume leadership that they never assumed before because they feel that there is this need. The story will continue after this. But as far as black leaders are concerned, I think that you'll agree we hear in the papers, see on television more about the young black militant leaders. We hear names like Carmichael and Brown and Cleaver and Newton and Seal. And you begin to wonder if perhaps they aren't getting more followers than some of the older civil rights leaders. Well, there are those persons who don't, uh, who at least say they don't believe in nonviolence uh, as a tactic. Uh, but I tend to feel that there are many more people who believe, uh, who at least believed, say they believed in the things that Martin Luther King believed in, than there are who believe in violence and destruction. Uh, I think we tend to hear those people who speak loudest, and sometimes they are persons who, uh, whose message is, is uh, exaggerated out of proportion uh, very often. Uh, there, yeah, there, there, are, there is this determination on the part of many black people who are called militants, uh, this, d d this determination uh, and this, this desperation, the, the fact that they want right now, and I do too, we want, Martin Luther King wanted uh, equality, now. justice, right now. Uh, I think we all want the same things. Our goals are basically the same. Uh, but I tend to feel that, that uh, those things that he gave his life for uh, will become stronger rather than weaker because he has become now a martyr for his cause. And many of the poor people that he, uh, whose rights he fought for have hope somehow. It's a strange thing, but, but they have hope that they didn't have before, even though he's not here. Certainly your life has changed a good deal since last April, Mrs. King. What, what is your life like now? How much time to family? How much time to work? How much time to writing the book? I feel that my primary responsibility is to my family and bringing up my children. And they need me especially now that I'm the only parent. And I plan to, that is, as my first priority. Uh, aside from that, of course, I am writing the book, and I will have to see it finished, and this is going to take a good bit of my time. I am making some appearances. Uh, those things still, many of these things are connected with my husband's work. Now, this may be a difficult question for you to answer. Will this be, can this be, a happy Christmas in the King household? Christmas will be sad for us, as it will be for many people, I think, uh, this year. I, I would imagine that the whole nation uh, cannot really have a happy Christmas with these two great tragedies and the other conditions of the world is still involved in the war in Vietnam and all the problems of poverty and and the conflict in our in our urban crises and so on but I think that um, it doesn't mean that we will sit around and bathe in our grief I think that very often 
A time like this causes people to really reflect on the deeper meaning of, say, Christmas or any other occasion. I remember Easter of 1963 when my husband was jailed in Birmingham. I had just had my fourth child and was not was still confined to my house. And he had gone to jail on Good Friday. And Easter, I had not heard from him. And I was very depressed. But somehow, that was the most meaningful Easter that I have ever experienced. Because, you know, Easter is a time of suffering. But it's creative. You know, if it can be creative suffering. So I think if we can look on this Christmas season as a time for reflecting and a time to think of the deeper meaning and the real spirit of Christmas, which should, be, should, which should be the spirit of giving. And giving unselfishly. And I think, if we think in terms of my husband's life and his death in those terms, then we will not be as sad. We will be hopeful, because in his death, there is hope for redemption. Thank you, Mrs. King.